Flashamaniacs. Gearheads. We're ho- we hope you're ready because this is another time. Wow. Let me try again. We hope you're ready because it's time for another wonderfully geeky installment of the Geo Gearheads. I'm the bad cop with Daryl W4, and we're talking about QR codes for this, the 61st episode. Geeky is right, and this is another example of a topic of interest to geocachers, but not limited to geocachers, especially with the other location-based games making uh, use of the uh, technology in all kinds of good ways. Yeah, that's right. Now, next week, we're talking with someone very special about that's very specific to geocachers, and that's when Air Raid Fan will join us to talk about his special hides. Yeah, and as usual, we'll be recording that live through the Google Plus Hangouts on Air, so you can watch us live about uh, 6, 10 p.m. Central or 9, 10 p.m. Eastern on March 7th. If you have a question or comment, you can drop those in an email to geogearheads at cashmaniacs.com or call and leave a voicemail at 206-350-3647. That feedback really helps pick and shape the show's uh, this time, the foundation of the show, in a good portion, came from that feedback. You know, we're thankful to you for watching or listening to these shows, for your feedback, for sharing with friends, and for your support. We'd like to thank the Clackleberry Can, ooh boy, the Cackleberry Clan, for their PayPal donation. Those financial contributions help offset the expenses of the show and help keep the show's and even more fun coming. Yeah, and fun like the Geo Gearheads 2013 Traveler Race, which actually, as we're recording, starts tomorrow. But if you're watching this on one of the recorded versions or listening to it, uh, it's probably already started. And we have some great prizes uh, from GX Proxy, including the uh, book Discovered Memoirs of a Geocoin Designer. Uh, we have the Bright Light Torch, and we have this really awesome Wild Geist, as I think how it's pronounced, is watching Geocoin set that uh, when I showed it to Firefly, she was really drooling over it. <laughs> but of course, we are still accepting donations. We still have a bunch of stuff that we haven't mentioned here, and you can see the whole list of everything that's been donated so far on the uh, uh, post for the uh, Traveler Race, and we'll link to that, of course. Uh, so if you want to uh, send in something for it, you know, please go ahead. And you still have plenty of time to add your travelers to the race, mm-hmm. whether you get them in by the third or by the first or not. You know, it really doesn't matter so much as long as you get a whole lot of uh, discovery logs. And it's really all about the fun anyhow. But if you take a uh, uh, traveler and release it at something like a mega event, I'm sure you're going to get uh, tons and tons of people uh, logging in and you know, doing your uh, logs and discoveries and such on those. But as of this morning, when I checked, we only had a dozen people, and then us as well, but we don't count because, you know, we're hosts and we're just in it to have fun. Uh, But with a dozen people, we have a pile of prizes much bigger than that already. I haven't gone and counted it out. So at this point, your probability of winning something is pretty good, So it's worth getting into the uh, race. But with those 14 people, including us, there's a total of 17 travelers in there. So it is a a pretty interesting race already. It is. And, you know, right now we do have more prizes than people who have submitted. So everybody's guaranteed to win something at this point. But well, yeah, we don't want we to don't say want guaranteed. To keep it a secret. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm sure we're going to have a bunch of people. I've talked with a number of people who are uh, anxious to get uh, travelers in, and they've got some really great ideas that they're just trying to figure out how to actually make happen. So there are going to be a bunch more uh, uh, people dropping in, and hopefully, we're going to get a bunch more prizes because it would be really great if we had a prize for everyone who uh, uh, participates and you know I'm, I'm really enjoying looking at some of those uh, great tips and tricks that people are posting to their travelers. 
Oh, they really are some good tips and tricks. And, you know, some of them we've even featured here on this show. Maybe we didn't come up with them, but we've, uh, we've talked about them in the past. So. Yeah, yeah, and some great ones to share, including like the one that I did about uh, using QR codes. Hey, you know, that's what we're talking about tonight. Now, if you didn't know, a QR code is the abbreviation for a quick response code. QR code is a regis registered trademark of Denso Wave Incorporated. So we can't just go throw that around. It is a registered trademark. Now, qrcode.com is the official site for the information, and that's developed with the uh, main objective of a code read easily for the reader. So there you go. It's a matrix-style barcode. When we say matrix, we're talking not just linear, but also up and down. So rows and columns, kind of like a spreadsheet that you're, you're used to looking at. Um, it has square boxes and positions for alignment and dots. They're, they're called black modules. We'll get into that in a little bit, though. Yeah, and th this is nothing new. It's been around since uh, 1994. But really, the phones are what made this uh, so popular because they can be read with the uh, camera on the phone so easily. With the base structure of the QR code, and remember, this is built in 94. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of stuff that it's being used for that wasn't specifically engineered into the data set, but because of the way that they form the data sets, it really is uh, very flexible. And there's only those four data set types right now. And that's the numeric, alphanumeric, they have a, a byte binary mode, and also kanji because, well, it came from the Orient and you know, they needed something to do that. But most of the time, we've seen these used for URLs. They can also be used for just straight text, as we mentioned before, mm -hmm. for things like SMS messaging and for phone information, but it was originally designed for applications more uh, typical of barcodes like inventory control and that kind of stuff. Exactly, and that's what it was designed for originally was inventory control. Uh, and as I said, it's designed to be a quick read from the device standpoint. So before it was used for phones, it was whatever device they were using to scan it, that was designed to be quickly read and pass more information than just a standard barcode. Yeah, and we'll get into uh, capacities and stuff uh, a little bit later on. But we got a lot of great feedback about mm -hmm. how people are actually using the QR codes. So we wanted to start off with that and give you kind of uh, you know real-world applications for QR codes. And in this case, it's going to be in geocaching. Yes. Now, the first bit of feedback we have is from the Wooden Radio, a friend of mine. And he sent in this via email. And says, I'll make a short story a bit longer than it needs to be. And if you know the Wooden Radio... Anyway, I'll go on. The Maryland Geocaching Society holds four big events each year. They are potluck events, drawing well over 100 people each time. One of them, and a favorite that is eagerly anticipated for 364 days, is the one uh, that is over and the food hardly digested, and we're chomping at the bit for next year's events. This is known as Cash Across Maryland, or CAM, as many people know it, nothing to do with Cashamaniacs. <laughs> In mid-March, uh, 10 caches are set up for approval, and the pages emailed to the participants. The event is early May. We have six weeks, plus or minus, to locate all 10 caches and gather clues from them. About a week before the event, Mer the Maryland Geocaching Society sends out the magic decoder. I wonder if that's a ring. Uh, that <laughs> uses previously collected clues and decodes them into the coordinates for the picnic. This has been going on for 10 years, and for the past two or three, uh, and again this year, the caches will include QR codes with the clue. The caches do have the clue in plain text uh, in the container for those that don't have those smart devices. To take a look at what the event is like, search for CAM space dash on geocaching.com to see what the caches have been in the past. They range from the Allegheny Mountains in the far western Maryland to the Atlantic on the eastern shore of Maryland. We've had uh, cash across Mer Marylanders, Marylanders <laughs> from all over the mid-Atlantic. Uh, it's the high points of the year here in Maryland. 
Well, I did want to get a little bit more information about how they're actually using the uh, QR codes. So we did get a, another reply from him. So you want to uh, uh, read that for us now too? Sure. Um, yes, there's nothing for the clue in the cache to point to. It might read something like cam 2012 mariner point equals K. Uh, just before the picnic, the Maryland Geocaching Society will send out a decode sheet, a typical one like N39AJ.GTB. Uh, 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 now, he says, I'm putting laminated QR codes in my caches, like that attached, uh, as well as my trackable name tag. And they take me directly to the log page for the caches and the trackables. Yeah, that basically all they're doing with the QR codes from what he's uh, uh, shown us here is just logging, just taking you to the log page for the cache, which can be really handy if you don't have one of those apps. But uh, it, it's basic uh, stuff, and I just uh, actually finished the uh, write-up uh, for doing the QR codes for travelers that I had promised like months ago. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But... It's a great way to get uh, something into the uh, cache. You know, just taking them to the cache page is mm -hmm. a, a possibility, and that's really easy with just using the uh, cord.info. But if you're going to get a little bit more uh, intricate, you can take them to things like that uh, decoder page. Just put a URL in there that goes and downloads the PDF even, or mm -hmm. you can take them to the uh, page, you know, an HTML page or something like that where they can do it. All kinds of great stuff that you can uh, do because it is so versatile and anything that's a URL is going to be accessible through the uh, QR codes. Exactly. Of course, that assumes you have data on your device. It does, well, but you can store it and go back and check when you have a, a data connection somewhere else. Exactly. Now, all the QR readers that I've used has the ability to store the uh, addresses. You can look in the history of all the ones you've scanned. I'm not saying that's universal, but that seems to be my experience. Yeah, most of them will do that. And really what you want to do is not so much for geocaching. We really have to worry about this yet. But with any of these QR readers, you probably want to have it uh, so that it doesn't automatically launch whatever that is. You want to take a look at it. Make sure that it's not some... Uh, a mm -hmm. site that might be nefarious, know where you're going, as always, because you, there are you know, some malicious things happening out there, and we've heard and seen of uh, situations, especially, I want to say it was Europe and Japan, where people have been putting out malicious uh, um, codes where they'll go and spam people using SMS and such. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of this, if they're using URL shorteners, you don't know where it's going ahead of time, but just, you know know where you're getting the QR code from. Yeah, and, and uh, some of the readers will that. actually be good about uh, taking those URL uh, shorteners and actually expanding out the link. Mm -hmm. So that's something to look for in a good QR reader. But we'll get into that a little bit more later. First, why don't you uh, share with us what we heard from uh, Juris1C? He wrote us via email, greetings from Latvia. While listening to GeoGearHead's Podcast 60, last week's, Ontario Trails Project, I learned that the next podcast will be about QR codes and geocaching. This let me recall a recent event I attended where QR codes were the main element to get the final coordinates of the meeting place. Sounds a lot like the uh, Cache Across Maryland. I'm talking about a night event, and excuse me, I'm going to do my best to pronounce this in Latvian. Ar Mani Pat Pingvini Nurani, 2013, or translated, and this one we'll all get, right? Even penguins don't talk to me, 2013. I love that name. If you want to look more, it's GC43RZ3, which took place in northern Latvia. There's some English on the uh, cache description page and one particular logging English, so you get the idea of the event in our geocaching community in general. Now, back to the QR codes. The task was to complete a QR code by solving 13 tasks. Each task would return an answer in binary format, so ones and zeros, which then would be colored into the missing line of the final QR code. It's not so easy to explain in words. Please take a look at the enclosed picture. Uh, the red square was empty, and at the 
and at the beginning, and by solving each task numbered on the right side, you would get one line of missing data. The tasks themselves were quite interesting. For example, a small light source blinking, a short splash is zero, a long splash is one. A sound file, kind of a song, uh, where you have to listen for cows, those were zeros, or cat, that was a one. Panic in the forest. You walk in 90 degree turns look for, and looking for reflectors on trees. A right turn was one, a left turn was zero. And a version of who owns zebra puzzle. So if, you know, doing all this, it, I'm looking at the, the picture of it and it's amazing. What it is, is these binary codes you're filling in, uh, I assume, black squares for one, leaving the, the zeros empty and you're actually creating the body of a QR code. Yeah, this is really cool what they've done here. Uh, this is a template that you know, I'm sure they had to uh, print out where they have those registration marks pre-filled in uh, along with some of the other uh, modules, but then they have a 13 by 13 block that's basically just grid paper and you have to color in those dots in order to be able to get the scannable QR code. So I was really impressed with this uh, as a type of puzzle cache. Mm -hmm. you know, this is something I'd like to uh, uh, see some people around here try, and hopefully some of our uh, listeners and you know, our great audience members have actually uh, tried it out and done something like this themselves. You know, I've considered doing something, not even to this extent, but taking a QR code and printing it across four pieces of paper, and you have to line them up properly before it'll scan. Yeah, yeah, that would be another good way to do it. You know, I've, I've also seen people do stuff like uh, uh, puzzles, where you actually have to assemble a puzzle at the uh, uh, final, you know, at the first stage or whatever. And actually, we've done one of those where we had a fish puzzle. It was actually a three D fish, hmm. which had the coordinates written on it. Mm -hmm, so when you mm -hmm. put the fish together, you got the final coordinates. So you could do something like that with a QR code. And you know, the only problem would be you have to have a QR code reader and just give them the coordinates in plain mm -hmm. text. You know, I've also seen where they've had coordinates on the back side of a puzzle. You could do that with a QR code. If you could print it onto that puzzle somehow, flip it over, and then you'd have to assemble the puzzle to get the QR code. Yeah, well, and there are printable puzzles that you can buy. That's true. So all you have to do is uh, run it through the uh, printer, and all of a sudden you have a puzzle coming out the other side, essentially. <laughs> Now, I don't know how, long, how well those would actually stand up to a lot of usage, but they're fun, and it'd be worth giving us a try. And yeah, one of these days, maybe I'll actually have a, a cache location and can try that in. There you go. Now, we also heard from uh, Cyphrix via Google+, and he said, I love playing with QR codes. App on Android for generating your own QR codes. I thought about it uh, like a small geocaching treasure hunt in the backyard with my nieces and nephews with a couple of candy at the end to get them started at a young age so they can cache with me when they get older. I think the app that I use is called QR Generator. Now, that I thought was a really interesting idea, but it does pose some uh, problems of how are you going to actually get that set up to work right? Well... If you're just going to do it in your own backyard, I think just put the key, hide the QR codes around as just plain text. So it says, you know, go to the swing set under the slide, um, you know. Yeah, and that's a good way to do it, but it, it doesn't really get them into the geocaching. It's more of a treasure hunting kind more, of uh, right. thing. I was kind of thinking of uh, maybe you could actually get into using um, Google Maps or something. Just give them a Google Map URL, and then you know mm. you guys have to uh, go find the pin. So it's another way that you could uh, get into that uh, without actually having you know a geocache, just using some old phone. That would work well, yeah. Yeah, and because it's in the backyard, you wouldn't even need data service on the phone. Hopefully, your Wi-Fi reaches out there, and right, you know, just give them the old phones. And a lot of people are doing this now. That's be, uh, become one of the big questions I've seen on a lot of the uh, uh, mod forums for Android: is how do I disable the phone entirely on my old phone that I'm going to give to my two-year-old because I don't want them accidentally calling emergency services? Exactly. Exactly. And popping out the SIM is not going to do it. You've got to be able to disable that phone radio. 
Right, right. Yeah, the, this is something that uh, some people might not realize is that in the U.S., any cell phone with or without a SIM, no matter what its situation is with the uh, service, must be able to contact emergency services. Mm -hmm. So even if you don't have a contract, you will be able to call 911 and get an emergency operator through any cell phone that operates on any network in the U.S. Yep. Uh, that can be a problem if you're passing the phone down to your child and they accidentally dial up uh, the emergency services and you have to pay for the bill for a false <laughs> alarm. That can get expensive quickly. It can. But, but you know, speaking of phones and calling... Yeah, we are going to get a little bit off of uh, the geocaching thing. Uh, we already pretty much are. And we have a voicemail here from uh, Wayward Wanders, who's actually out on the other side of my state. Hi, um, Geo Gearheads. This is Tom from Wayward Wanders, calling from the west coast of Michigan. And just wanted to call and kind of give you a heads up on something, and maybe you can help me out or help me understand. But a couple of weeks ago, I was lucky enough to get an iPhone 5. And they have really been impressed with the geocaching app on there. Um, find that it's not near as accurate as my um, my Oregon, which I would have never thought. But um, one other thing I tried is I downloaded the Mundy app. And I probably would have never even heard of Mundy if it wasn't for you guys talking about it on a couple of the different shows. And over in this area, there's a lot of them hidden. But here's what I'm running into. Most of them are hidden sometime in 2011 or very early 2012. Most have anywhere between like zero and seven finds is about the highest, or captures, I guess they call it, the highest I've seen so far. But most of them just aren't even around anymore, um, or they're so old and neglected that the phone won't even read the QR code. So it's getting a little discouraging. I've hunted for about 25 of them, and I've only captured one. So I'm just wondering if that's a phenomenon that's happening um, all around or if that's just unique to my area over here because what well, if I could find them and get them to be read, I could really roll up some numbers here pretty quick. Um, so I appreciate any feedback and help from you guys. Look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. All right. Well, that does get into some of the problems with the uh, Munzees and QR codes in general which is you will run into problems with those things being uh, uh, you know, weathered and unreadable. Mm -hmm. But I know many of those uh, cash or Munzees out there because uh, some friends and I went out for what was at the time the first Munzee power run because one of the Munzee hiders out there had placed them. And the Munzees that he placed out there was his first set of uh, Munzees that he had gone out and placed in bulk. And they weren't done all that well uh, as far as weatherproofing and such. So even within a few weeks of placement, a lot of those started having problems. This is one of the reasons why I've stopped making my Munzees as much as I uh, had initially. Not that I'm doing a whole lot of Munzees anymore because no one around here really comes and finds them. But uh, I do like using the tags to solve that problem. However... Now that you've got these Munzees that you can't scan, there's not much hope for doing anything. Uh, there used to be some hacks. Uh, some of those older ones, there were some hacks, but we're not going to go into that because it does enable some cheating, and we don't really like that. No. Uh, but the best thing to do is just mark them as needing maintenance and hope that uh, the Munzee owner will come out and repair those. Mm -hmm. But... You know, this is one of the things that you really have to make sure when you do any kind of QR codes is that they are going to be readable long term. Exactly. Uh, with Munzees, with uh, QR codes of any kind, if you put them in a cache, what have you, it's really important that they're laminated to begin with, with a good quality laminate that's going to keep the water out. You don't want to trim that too close to the edge where you might uh, have a, a, a hole there for water to get in. Um, you know, I've come across Munzees that were just simply printed on stickers and stuck up. And, you know, if you get them in the first week, you're lucky. Otherwise, there's just not enough left to even read. Yeah, there are some materials that work very well. 
I had a lot of success using the uh, adventure paper by mm -hmm. uh, National Geographic, which is actually more like a plastic than it is a paper. So that did hold up very well. It lasted really well. The problem that I had with those is because of the uh, type of material, it didn't stick with most of the adhesives I was using to either the magnets and you didn't really want to take that and stick it on directly onto the signs. Mm -hmm. But there are also some sign materials that you can get for uh, inkjet printers that will work beautifully that are designed for it. But that can get a little bit expensive, and it's just generally cheaper to go out and buy them from Lindsay. If you're doing it for something like a cash or whatever, then that's something that you really want to look into. And when you're printing your own like that, there are some really cool options for kind of dressing up your uh, QR codes and making mm -hmm. them more interesting. I wanted to uh, give one uh, suggestion to Wayward Wanderers. I have come across very faded Munzees in the field. And what I've been able to do, it's, it takes a bit of work. And, you know, I had the time to kill, is take a good camera with you. Snap a picture take that uh, SD card out. I had my iPad with me and I was able to increase the contrast of the black and white portion of the Munzee enough that it was able to scan. There are ways around it, but it takes a lot of work and you've really got to be dedicated. Yeah, there. The, I, I wasn't really going to get into that because it does take multiple devices mm -hmm. and I don't know how many people do it, but that can be a lot of fun, too, is we actually tried doing uh, the scanning of the Munzee through the camera on one onto another. Mm -hmm. So you basically stack up the phones. Mm -hmm. And we've gotten a few of them where we could actually get all three scans to take at exactly the same time. So if you can get something like that, though, you know, just take the photo with one uh, camera, mm -hmm. you know, one phone, one iPad, one, you know, Nexus, uh, you know, whatever that, uh, phone or whatever it is, and you can get all kinds of uh, cheap and free utilities to play with the contrast. And in most cases, if it's faded and you can get anything out of it, you will be able to increase the contrast enough where you'll be able to get a good scan. But also take a look at your lighting. Mm -hmm. and make sure that you don't have any glares. Make sure that it's nice, even lighting. Uh, a lot of people I know will take a fluorescent flashlight rather than uh, mm. one of the LED flashlights because the fluorescent spreads and is a softer light. You can also do some tricks to the LEDs too, but you know fluorescent is cheap. But if you just shield the uh, QR code and give it a nice even light, that will help a lot. And mm. one of the things that I really hate is the flashes on these cameras when you're trying to do QR codes or just about any kind of scanning it has such a bright hot spot in the middle that it will actually impede scanning in mm -hmm. many cases. Mm -hmm. So most of the time you'll find you're better off without the light than with the light. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, I've done it. I've oftentimes I have better success with my headlights than I do with a flashlight. Oh, absolutely. Again, it's a bigger light source that's going to diffuse and, you know, so yeah, if anytime you get that small light source, it's going to cause more problems. You want something that's big and soft for things like this. On the Munzee front, though, there is some news for Munzee this week, which are social Munzees. And this is kind of interesting. It's uh, no points, locationless, and you assign a custom logo up to 500 by 500 pixels, but there is still a file size limit that I kept running into when I played with mine. One goes free to each premium member, and you can buy them if you'd like, additional ones, or if you're not a premium member, buy them for $5 each. Basically, what I see these as is their version of a trackable. Yeah, kind of. I mean, you could easily print them, put them in your car. Um, at the uh, block party last year, uh, one of the local cashers printed up a Munzee and then uh, was able to talk with the, with the folks at Munzee and made that a locationless Munzee for the day. So this way, everybody can do it now. So you could have your own Munzee t-shirt. Yeah, the difference, though, is that this doesn't have any points. So it gets mm -hmm. a little bit weird, and we kind of wondered... Uh, what people thought about it and OBX Geek via Google Plus had replied that the ones for sale I don't exactly understand to be honest. The free ones 
for premium members works and I plan to print it out on a sticker and add it to my hello my name is tag for going to events but I don't think I would spend five dollars to do that neither or neither I nor the people were getting points from it mm-hmm. and oops and along that use case with no uh, points I would like it better if people could scan it more than once but maybe limited to one scan a day so people could cap off it cap it at multiple events that you know still want to overload the servers I am sure there were a lot of ideas talked about, shot down, and revived when the team was designing them, so I'm guessing that this was the best compromise they could get. I would like to see an event, Munzee, something the owner can deploy at a location, and it's there for X number of hours, then it undeploys and can be redeployed at a new location by the owner in a future, and would give points to both owner and capturer. That's the type of locationless piece I am really looking for these are pretty much the same as a car or name tag travel bug now he also continued a little bit later on so giving it a little or giving it another few minutes of thought they may have been trying to combine a few things together in one solution it gives them the name tag car travel bug option it also can be used for a bonus Munzee where you find a number of Munzees and collect some information from them to get the final location where you Mm -hmm. could find one of these social ones and then you could cap it off and earn the badge that the owner creates. Downside, there isn't a location locked, or that isn't location locked, so someone can take a picture of the code and then everyone can have your cool badge, so probably not the best implementation, but it could work. Yeah, that's true. Uh, there are drawbacks to it. The idea is the social Munzee, you know, I've seen them all over uh, Facebook and Google+. So they're, they're out on the social medias. Yeah, and really the way that it, it it is more like the name tags, the tattoos, the car trackables, that kind of stuff, where it's a discovery kind of trackable. And it's kind of cool. I'm certainly not interested at $5 to have one. But it, I do I do think looking at the way they've laid it out, that it is more that badge mentality than it is uh, something like the uh, collect all the trackables and logs. It's, you know, you earn the badge for that one a QR mm-hmm. code and you're done. Mm-hmm. But right now it's not going to be available in the um, mobile apps. You can't see that at all. And I did get confirmation from one of the developers that version 2 will have the support for it. And we still don't have a date for version 2, but version 2 is coming and is going to be very different from what we're used to today. I look forward to that. Uh, the, back to the $5 price. That is significantly less expensive than a premium membership. So if you really wanted this, you can go ahead and add it without the, the expense of a premium member. Yeah, and the premium membership is uh, cool because you can also get the things like the virtuals mm-hmm. uh, included. But uh, yeah, I, I just don't know if that's... Uh, where I would want to go, and one of the things that was mentioned is putting that uh, QR code on the name tag, and I do that with my name tag for uh, geocaching.com, and I had a number of people who were asking about it, and as I mentioned earlier, I finally got around today to writing that up on how to do it, and we'll include a link in the uh, show notes, but this basically goes back to what uh, they were talking about for the Cache Across Maryland uh, caches, is they're just putting a QR code in that takes you right to the log page. Mm -hmm. There's a few different ways to do it, uh, and I talk about that in that post. But one of the tricks that I finally succumbed to was making those uh, long URLs, because I want to include the discovery flag in there so that Mm -hmm. when it takes you to the page, it knows that it's going to be discovery so people don't accidentally steal my car. (laughs) <laughs> which has happened many times to me. So you, know, well, you I don't do like live in Detroit. Steal my car. Yeah, this is true. <laughs> uh, in any case, so uh, one of the things I've uh, done is actually run that through a URL shortener because it makes it easier to scan. And it's one of those things I really rather not use URL shorteners just for the fact that it, adding a middleman and you know who knows if they might have problems and you know it's just one of those I'd rather go direct to the uh, destination mm-hmm. rather than stopping mm-hmm. for drinks at the uh, 
you know, McDonald's along the way. So it, there are some advantages in by reducing that length of the uh, URL. It makes it more readable and you know, it, it decreases the uh, density and therefore yeah. makes it more readable. Exactly. But one of the other things I was also pointing out uh, is that will also give you a way, in most cases, to keep track of who's actually gone and logged your, or not even logged, but just scanned it. How many times has that been scanned? So you get an idea of how many people have gone through and tried it at an event, because that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to give you the actual... uh, uh, you know, if they scan it, they're not necessarily going to go through and log it, but at least that way you know, hey, I had 20 people scan it even though I had one person log it. Exactly. It does give you those stats. <clears throat> now, let's get back to some of the specs on the QR code. If you wanted to go for numeric only, and no uh, uh, decimals, no nothing like that, just the numbers 0 through 9, Mm-hmm a QR code can actually hold 7,089 characters, or actually, I guess that's digits. So that's an awful lot of information to pack into some small little optical square like that. Mm -hmm. When you go to alphanumeric, though, it does shift from that 7,000 and change to just under 4,300. It's actually 4,296 characters. And that only gives you the 0 through 9 again, Uppercase A through Z, uh, the space character, dollar sign, percent sign, uh, asterisk, uh, plus, minus, uh, decimal, slash, and colons. So it lets you take care of uh, most of those uh, URLs. You, know, you might have some issues here and there with uh, some characters, but uh, you know, just about everything most people can think of are going to be covered in that alphanumeric. And that's what good portion of those uh barcodes that we see are. Mm -hmm. We also mentioned that there's the binary or byte mode. That only gives them 2,953 characters and it uh, uses the ISO 8859-1 standard, which no, I don't expect most of you to know (laughs) and I don't think most people are even going to (laughs) care. We also mentioned that it does support uh, kanji and kana, which is uh, Japanese character sets. And in that case, it goes down even further to only 1,817 characters. So that's using the Shift JIS X20 or 0208. So another one of those things I'm sure no one really knows much about. But that's your capacity for those. However, as we were just talking about, it's when you get that kind of density, it does make it very difficult for things like cameras on smartphones to scan. So you want to keep it a lot, you know, lot simpler than that. And you know, we were talking before the show, Bad Cop, about the error correction, mm-hmm. which is something you really want to use. You want that error correction, but that can affect the uh, capacity of the uh, QR code as well. That's right. Uh, just for grins and giggles before the show, I wanted to see, could I really get an alphanumeric uh, QR code of just under 4,300? And the largest I could get was 2,500. And I'm thinking, well, why is that? Why am I missing these extra characters? It's not that i ever going to you know, put a small novel into a QR code, but uh, I couldn't get it to scan at any larger than that. Now, the error correction, there are four different error correction modes. You have low, which 7% of the code words of those uh, little squares there can be restored. Medium gets you up to 15%. Quartile is 25%. And the high is 30% of the code words that can be restored. What this allows is you to put, say, a logo into the middle of your QR code. Um if the camera or the device can't read that section in the middle because, well, it's a graphic instead of a QR code, it'll figure out based on what's around it and be able to restore up to 30% of those quote-unquote missing characters. 
Well, and the other thing that's really important for our application is if you have a portion of that that gets damaged, it can also recover better if you have the high. So if you have the choice, and not all of the uh, QR generators, especially the free, cheap, easy one kind of things that you get on the web, they won't necessarily have the option to set that error correction. And typically, if that's the case, it is set for one of the uh, higher ones, but you really want to go for that uh, quartile, which is a 25% or the high 30%, if at all possible. Now, if you're trying to make it really small, you know, as we mentioned, that does add additional information in, and by adding in that error correction, you may make it unscannable if it's you know too small to you know get the information readable by a camera. So exactly. you may have to play with that if you're actually getting into making the QR codes. Mm -hmm. So it is something to uh, worry about. But you know what I was thinking about, Bad Cop, when you were talking about uh, only getting about uh, 2,500 characters in there. I'm thinking that might have actually been a binary uh, encoded or a byte encoded uh, QR code rather than the alphanumeric. And, you know, I hadn't seen a whole lot on it, but I'm wondering if that's how they're actually doing the URLs is uh, through the binary encoding rather than text because things like the question marks aren't supported. And I know I'm doing question marks in my QR codes. Exactly. Now I did it as purely text. I went to a website, grabbed a large portion of text and copy that in there, and I, I did it just as free text, plain text, however the, the website uh, phrased that. So I, I thought it was interesting. But yeah. perhaps it had one of the, um, what do I want to say, non-included characters uh, yeah. in the alphanumeric. That could easily uh, throw mm -hmm. it off as well. Because what do we so, see? One, two, three, four. We see eight to nine different characters besides letters, and there's so much more on a keyboard. Yeah, yeah, and that's the thing. There are a lot of characters not supported by the uh, uh, alphanumeric, so it, who knows, being a web-based tool, it might have seen something and thrown it into byte mode. Mm -hmm. So we really don't know uh, how that worked. But one of the things we haven't mentioned yet is how to actually scan these. And the easiest way to tell people to how to scan them is to just go to whatever marketplace you're on or go do a web search for quick mark one word q i k or q i bleh, q u i c k m a r k one word no spaces and the reason that uh, we suggest this one is it is a good quality app it might not be the best one it might not be the most robust however it's a quality app it does the uh, uh, previews and that kind of stuff if you have it set up that way. And it's available for Android, Bada, Chrome, iOS, Mac OS, S60, Windows, and Windows Phone. I don't know of anything else available on that many uh, platforms. Mm -hmm. And one of the coolest things is I just found out by going and uh, hitting their website today that they have a Chrome extension. So I can actually just, in my web browser, right-click and decode a uh, URL or a QR code or right-click and encode a uh, URL into a QR code right there. Right there. Um, it's fabulous, without it a is. doubt. I, I really enjoy it. And, you know, there's several things. Uh, for instance, the, uh, the Munzies that are coming across uh, Google+, Plus. you can grab that and quickly uh, decode it. Yeah, I actually did that with my uh, social Munzee, but especially for the puzzle caches, that's going to come in handy. And because it does do multiple modes and gives you multiple bits of information, including what's the encode on it. So if you're uh, looking for solving a QR code puzzle where it's doing QR codes mm -hmm. on the cache page, that might be the answer is uh, grabbing the plugin like that and doing the decode. But let's talk a little bit about encoding, you know, creating the... Uh, uh, actual QR codes, and just a, again, just about any platform that you could ever want, you can find some kind of uh, application for it. And I just did a quick search and found one for just about every major platform mm -hmm. I could think of. And I've put that list on the uh, QR uh, Traveler thing that I did. But let's run through it real quick and post them in our show notes too. Uh, do you want to start with the Android apps? Sure. 
For Android, you have QR Droid, My QR Code Generator, QR Code Generator. And then under iOS, we have QR Code Maker, QR Code Creator, QR Reader for iPhone, and QR Reader for iPad. And I actually use the one for the iPhone. Uh, that was something that was recommended to me. It is a reader and a generator, which makes it uh, kind of handy. Yeah, I have I have a couple of them that will not only read but generate. For Linux, you have QR Encode, all one word. Yeah, and that's about the only one I found there. Uh, for Mac OS, again, there's a whole bunch of them out there. There's a Aztec Code Generator, QR Factory, Professional QR Code Reader, or Creator, sorry, uh, QR Beam, and that's actually the one that I used because it did uh, more formats than anything else I could find. And, you know, that one is a pay for app, and a lot of these uh, are going to be pay for apps, but a lot of them are also free. Yeah, exactly. Now, for Windows, the one we like is the Yeblon, Y E B L O N, QR code generator, APP for or app for Windows. Yeah, and for Windows Phone, there's also a QR code uh, generator, Windows Phone, and Linky, L Y N K E E. So there you had a couple of options for uh, that mobile platform. But one of the things I always like, are the web-based options because they work on just about anything. So why don't you give us some of those? Exactly. They'll work on any device you can get to the Internet. And uh, all these that we're listing are free. So you got the QR code generator. you got QR stuff, G-O-Q-R dot me, go QR me. And uh, QR code generator by Deliver. Yeah, and that one I've actually used a few times. It's a nice little web service that comes with its own shortener. So you don't have to go through, you know, if you wanted to do a shorter URL to make it more scannable, you just take that full URL, drop it right in, and it shortens it right there. And that's true with actually a lot of those web-based ones is they'll at least have the option to do it. So most of those are free. Some of them will limit how many you can do each day, and they typically will limit the options that you have but they'll just generate either a GIF or a uh, JPEG or something mm -hmm. like that, which you can save off and print or do whatever you want with it. So it's a good free way to get started. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if Google still has it, but they had a QR code generator. You could dump in a whole list of URLs and it would, uh, it would spit out QR codes for you. Yeah, and if you're into the whole development thing, there's all kinds of... Uh, additional toolboxes and stuff that you can set up for it and yeah, all kinds of things. And we really can't get into it uh, too much in a show like this because there's so much and so many to do. Mm -hmm. Now, Daryl, just, just because, um, I did take a and use a bunch of the different web-based uh, generators, put in the same thing on different websites, and the QR codes look different. So there are different options there, either for um, uh, error correction or something else that's producing a different looking QR code. Yeah, there's different modes. There's different ways to do it, different ways, I'm sure, to handle the error correction. And you know, because you have the error correction, you can do all kinds of other weird things, uh, you know, move around a few pixels and make it uh, unique, whatever, who knows. Uh, and that's the other thing is if you really get into this, there are some very high-end uh, choices that will give you the option to add in graphics and will actually make sure that you get a good code that is usable for just about mm -hmm. anything. Exactly. Well, that pretty much wraps up what we're going to cover on QR codes for this week. Now, next week, we're talking with Air Raid Fan about his hide, so cashers are really going to want to take a moment and listen to this. This is uh, this is going to be a fabulous show. So check the Cashew Maniacs website at cashewmaniacs.com for more on the Geo Gearheads, including show notes for this and all of our episodes. We love hearing from our listeners, so leave us feedback by calling 206-350-3647 or by calling... We love hearing... We love hearing from our listeners, so leave us feedback by calling 206-350-3647, by emailing geogearheads at cashmaniacs.com, or through social media. Your support helps keep the Cash Maniac shows coming. Please consider making a PayPal donation through the link on our website to support the Cash Maniac shows. Geo Gearheads is produced by Chris Uffenauer and Daryl Wandberg. 
This show is copyright 2012 by Daryl Weinberg. All rights reserved. <laughs> Thank you.